Hi, I'm John Heffernan. Welcome to another edition of Men at Their Best. Joining me tonight is one of the nation's most visible advocates of law and order. Uh, nearly 14 years ago, he founded the Guardian Angels. Uh, he's currently still an integral part of that organization, in addition to uh, hosting his own morning radio talk show with his wife, Lisa, uh, on WABC AM radio. Curtis Sliwa, thank you very much for being oh, here. Oh, pleasure to be nice here. Nice to meet you. Uh, thanks for coming down. Um, the last eight, ten months of your life has been uh, certainly uh, a difficult time for you. Um, before we get into that, I think it's, it's important to explore a little bit of your history and the Guardian Angels, how it all happened. Um, born and raised in Brooklyn, New mm -hmm. York. Canarsie, Brooklyn. Canarsie, Brooklyn. So blue collar working class section. Right. And uh, unlike what people think, they have this stereotype because they say, well, Curtis Sliwa, I remember him well, it was about 14 years ago out of the South Bronx, that Puerto Rican kid who got together some blacks and Hispanics and began patrolling the subways. Mm -hmm. Wrong. I was a blue-collar kid, I grew up in an Italian-Jewish environment, very strong ethnic background, which had a lot to do with my outlook towards community, mm -hmm. because uh, Canarsie was a place where people looked after one another, whether they were black or white or right. in between. It was just strong foundation. Right. And from there, obviously, in going to school and traveling about the city, I ended up a night manager of a McDonald's on Fordham Road in Webster, mm -hmm. not too far from Fordham University. And that's where I essentially got the idea for the Guardian Angels, two years of preparation. And that's when we began to descend into the bowels of New York City and the slime and grime of the subway. And so began the Guardian right. Angels. You know, I think, I think the Curtis Lee that, uh, you know, the, I know, the media knows, the public knows, is not something that happened overnight, as you just suggested. Um, it was something you were kind of brought up with in mm -hmm. terms of what the Guardian Rain Angels represents. Um, I thought it was a funny story about the Daily News. You were a Daily News carrier and yeah. voted uh, Carrier of the Year because of something. Tell us what happened with that. Well, uh, in that Canarsie community, had the traditional newspaper boys, girls, who would rise early in the morning before the uh, rooster would crow twice. Right. And you try to get out your dailies and Sunday papers uh, to everybody before they'd run off to work or to school themselves. And I was doing quite well with my daily news uh, paper out, but I wasn't extraordinary. Right. And then one morning I happened to uh, stumble upon a building that was like lit up like a Christmas tree, except it was on fire. Mm -hmm. And this is one of those old wood frame houses. So the smoke was thick, the flames were pouring out of the second right. floor. And uh, I was like half out of it just in the fact I still hadn't gotten all the nuts and bolts together. Right. It was so that early. early. Right. And I uh, bolted in. Uh, the door blew off because I was completely unaware that the tremendous amount of heat was actually what was the pounding sound that I thought yeah, were people on the other side of that right. front door. So I'm trying to force my way in. The hot air is pushing me out. And so as I leveraged in, the hot air blew me back, knocked me on my backside, but I was able to recover and then scurry in and carry out about six, seven people in different trips in and out. Uh, and uh, for that was rewarded as uh, one of the nation's top newspaper carriers when Richard Nixon was president. How old a kid were you back then? About I was 16 years old mm -hmm. and they brought us down for a grand ceremony at the White House where the president then gave us a citation and a pen and a tie clip and uh, oh well that was the uh, start of many better things to come. Yeah, um, one of the maybe not so better things that happened just maybe a year or two later was uh, you attended Brooklyn Prep right. and uh, your senior year expelled for a dress code violation. What, what was that all about and why, why did it happen? Well, when you're young, uh, you believe that, uh, well, if you're taught about democratic principles, then you ought to practice what you preach. Mm -hmm. But uh, not having the maturity yet to understand that if mom and dad are putting together their precious nickel, dimes, and pennies to send you to a Jesuit Catholic high school, it's so that you'll wear the doggone jacket and tie and have a sense of discipline and a decorum. Well, I was student government president, elected by the students in my senior year. I'd been doing quite well, probably would have went to Brown University. But a plebiscite came up. Students wanted to vote out the wearing of jackets and ties the second half of their senior year. Mm -hmm. 
The administration cautioned me. They said, look, Curtis, we're going to be quite frank with you. Don't rock the boat on this because you're, you're really shaking the foundation of what this institutional learning is all about. But I pursued it. I pushed it. I stuck it in their face. The vote was in favor of not wearing the jackets and ties. I wouldn't compromise. And the Jesuits, although they're very open-minded in the classroom, they're sort of to the right of Ayatollah Khomeini outside the classroom. And they gave me the boot. Mm -hmm. That was it. The old who scow. I was out on the outside looking in. And all the other the, my colleagues said I figured, hey, they'll walk out, you know, because this was in the era of protests in Vietnam. They didn't budge. Mm -hmm. Why? Why do you think? Uh, and I don't mean to generalize here, but with today's young kids, um, all the influence of the MTV generation, and I, I think a, a general apathy among amongst some of the younger set, you don't see as much of that today as maybe you would. And, and of course, it's a sign of the times, but. Kit, what do you think the reasons are why something like that wouldn't happen today, whereas it was so prevalent back when you were a kid? Well, times were changing so rapidly, so quickly in terms of the civil rights struggle, in terms of uh, young people feeling that they could make a, di a difference. Coming out of the age of Kennedy and Camelot, nowadays, since I deal with a new generation of guardian angels, I say JFK, they say, oh, is he the one who slept with Marilyn Monroe and maybe killed her too? Right. Certainly not the John F. Kennedy I remember and the legacy of that time of change. Right. So I think that had a lot to do with it and also the fact that we were more weaned on the stories of our moms and dads who came out of the Depression era who kept reminding us the importance of hard work and making a difference and that right. you need to fight for change. Whereas nowadays, it's like a generation of couch potatoes. They vegetate on that couch in front of MTV 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Mm -hmm. And the mind process, although it's moving, it's not really engineered towards, uh, towards proactive uh, actions of any type. Who was important to you as a kid? I mean, was there anybody that in your mind stands out? Uh, maybe your parents, maybe be somebody else that, that maybe pushed you a little bit uh, early on in the direction uh, to where you are today? Uh, uh, definitely the parents, uh, because they were the nucleus and the very reason that I was able to begin taking on these very strange ideas and endeavors and actually put them into practice. They never said no. They were always supportive. They themselves were excellent role models. I didn't feel that they were hypocrites. And when it came to volunteer service, which was increasingly becoming a foreign notion to families who were, you know, trying to struggle to get the two cars in the garage and live the American dream, my parents received a great deal of satisfaction out of doing good for others. And I could see it on their face, their attitude. They, they embellished that within us. And my grandparents, who uh, told me of the stories of the way it used to be in Poland and Italy when they came over and the struggles they had, and that always lasted with me. Mm -hmm. So I'm beholden to them. And naturally, the influence of Martin Luther King and the Kennedys and the various political figures of that time, which uh, would leave an imprint on almost anyone who uh, grew up in those changing times. Bring me back to um, 1979 or that area when um, the Magnificent 13, as it was called, came to uh, the surface. And how did that? parlay into what the Guardian Angels is today? Well, right prior to that, I had developed a cleanup group voluntarily in the Bronx. And we had Did you have any, not to, any plans for school? or I, We have a bit of a jump here, mm -hmm. so what, go ahead. Tom. When I got the boot out of Brooklyn Prep, right. you would have thought that I would have pursued the rest of uh, the academic agenda. I didn't. Mm -hmm. uh, I was hard-headed. I went out there in the workplace. I was a gas jockey pumping gas into the wee hours in the morning and then a price jockey at a local AMP supermarket packing shelves and then eventually served my calling and boarded the number four train, the Muggers Express, up to the South Bronx to become a night manager for McDonald's. Now, I knew that wasn't my life. That, that was just a passing period. You're a young period. kid, too. But I had no intention right. of going to, on to college. Uh, I felt that uh, I was sort of on a certain path and uh, I didn't have an inclination to pursue higher education. So I was, for, the, for my purposes, it served me best because it really solidified my feet on the ground. I was no longer in these ideological battles amongst Jesuits and talking about, well, philosophically and theologically. Now it was dealing with people's needs to buy a package of Pampers right. and whether somebody would slit your throat for it or, or take money out of your pocket and how some didn't and others did. So I was able to watch the human experience before me 
And uh, I'm thankful for all those initial experiences I had after that great Jesuit education. So you, you get the cleanup thing going, Magnificent 13 comes about when? At what point? Well, in 1977, I had had a very successful volunteer cleanup program. You know, politicians uh, were like chickens up on the fence, cockle doodle doo. We love this cleanup group too, because that's antiseptic, all American. You don't sure. offend anybody. Sure. But I said, hey, the number one problem in the Bronx, the reason why everyone's leaving is not the garbage on the street, it's the human garbage, the predators, the people who are raping, savaging, killing. I call it the fraternity of the oozy-toting, dope-sucking, psychopathic killing machine. <laughs> Wait, you give that to me one more time? <laughs> what it's the fraternity of the oozy-toting, dope-sucking, psychopathic killing machines. That's great. They're on every street corner. Uh, they are sort of like Fagin-like creatures who train all the little ones into a one-way trip to Palookaville. So I'm sitting there in McDonald's slinging hamburgers, fries, shakes, and I'm saying, you know, I'm hiring many of these young people from the South Bronx community. And yes, I realize there are a lot of negatives, but there's the untapped potential good. I'll bet you if I create something that has the same attraction as a gang, really do it up in terms of style, red beret t-shirt, accentuate the use of machismo in the positive sense, camaraderie, but make it interracial. So overcome any of the problems that other groups have always had because they only represent one kind of people, one color, one belief, but represent everyone. And go out and protect people in the subways. Everyone has to use the subways, unless you were born with a silver spoon in your mouth. Right. And that's where the nucleus came, but people branded me with a V. Vigilante. I was Bronson in Death Wish, Buford Pusher and Walking Told, the Neuron Taxi Driver. They didn't want to hear any of the potential good. Right. They just had this stereotyped Hollywood vision of what this probably would become. Well, I mean, you certainly at that age, I don't, as a young kid, did you have the vision to say to yourself, geez, this could really go somewhere, or was it a day-to-day -day thing that built? What motivated you more than what you saw? What drove you from a career point of view? Was it anything like that, that in terms of the vision of this being something bigger than you could have ever imagined? Oh, I had the vision. Clearly, and I knew it would grow beyond just the borough of the Bronx or the subways of New York City. It there wasn't a doubt in your mind. It wasn't a doubt, except every day was the last day. The, uh, well, the numbers of trials and tribulations we were facing just rapidly uh, kept propelling itself. Unbe beyond anything I could have expected. Mayor Ed Koch was opposed to us. He thought of us as hemorrhoids and red berets. Police chief, police unions, police members, gangs, average people were terrified of us because they had come not to trust young people. Mm -hmm. And typical New York is so jaded and skeptical by this uh, pie in the sky philosophy. You know, all these saviors who have come down the pipe before said, you gotta be out of your mind, Sliwa. Mm -hmm. Your guys will be blackjacking us upside the head, stealing our pocketbooks in a week. This is just another con job. Mm -hmm. Who could blame them? But I didn't expect all that opposition. And, and a lot of the, the New York people, um, mm -hmm. on some level, were familiar with you because of the accolades that you had received from this initial group of, of cleanup uh, people. So were they very familiar with you or were you just totally new on the scene? And no, I was brand new. Uh, and worse yet, I was young right. and coming out of the Bronx where they had come not to trust anyone coming out of the Bronx who didn't have a college uh, parchment from Harvard or Stanford, who wasn't the uh, son of Salzburg from the New York Times, who didn't have any clout at City Hall. I was a nobody. My dad was a merchant seaman. My mom was a dental technician. We had, as they say in the street, no juice, no political pull, no rep. Mm -hmm. I was starting from scratch. So I had to build that reputation, and I had to build a trust with the people of New York very quickly. Well, how do you build it? I mean, money, how do you get visibility? How do you get people to come into your group? And, and I think some of the problems that you guys are having now uh, are a reflection of that difficult process. I mean, you really did peak, in my estimation, and maybe this is wrong, but it seemed that there was a peak for you, and now it may not be as high as it once was. Um, how did you build it up? And, and what, what has been the turning point for you today in terms of trying to get back to where it was? Maybe you disagree with that, um, but that's just... Oh, what I did was I sold the idea. And when you sell an idea, you have to hype it because you have to turn people's minds away from what they've been conditioned to believe. They had become conditioned to believe that you could not trust a young white, black, Hispanic, or Asian kid with this kind of power, power of making citizens arrest, protecting you, not becoming a gang member, not taking money from the drug dealers or drugs, 
but you know, walking the fine narrow line. They could How did you get? It. How did you recruit, though? How did you get the guys to put the caps on and the training? Tell me a little bit about that. Well, the initial group were all young men who had worked for me at that McDonald's. They were all part of the night crew, so they were called like quote the Burger Boys. Mm -hmm. Uh, although they were a strong nucleus, I knew that the organization would not re last very long with a group of burger boys going out into the subways of New York every night. <laughs> right. So I had to go back to Brooklyn, better known now as Crooklyn, which was where I was from, and personally visit a lot of the neighborhoods that I had had first-hand experience with and the Bronx. And I used the conduit of those two boroughs, reaching out to blacks, Hispanics, Asians, whites, going into their own turf, wrapping their lingo, being made a fool of 99% of the time, people sucking their bottoms lip, giving me the fickle finger of fate award, running me out on a rail. But slowly, a guy would come from here, a girl would come from here, a guy would come from here, and then they'd bring their cousin and brother. And before long, a pattern was established in which you saw the guardian angels, not as just of the Bronx or Brooklyn, black or white, but you saw them as multiracial and coming from all different sectors. When did you, when did the hype, or as you said, the hype, when did the, the impact of some of this hype, and um, you've recently had your own admissions to staging a couple of uh, events in your early years, and justifiably so or not, but in terms of the impact, and we'll get into that later, but in terms of the impact of the Guardian Angels, when did, it, when did you start to see some results? Well, remember, people were always anticipating that for all the good we were doing, the bubble would burst. That the very first time a guardian angel got killed in the line of duty or injured, we would revert to street tactics. We would pick up weapons. We would then become the aggressors. We wouldn't turn our cheek, take the verbal abuse and physical intimidation. We couldn't sustain ourselves under that kind of pressure from City Hall and the police unions. So when I say hype, what I mean is if hype is there and there's nothing behind it, then the idea will come crashing and burning. But if you have an idea and you're building on it, in the meantime, you're fueling it with a positive energy and putting it in a positive light, you're literally giving that concept a chance to breathe. So by 1983, we had pretty much overcome most of the odds, had begun to establish a track record, win the trust of the people, and I felt at that point we could begin to branch out around the world and begin taking on other activities that before that we were incapable of because we just had to try to survive from day to day. You're on record now as currently having uh, 67 chapters world, worldwide. Uh, no, actually 47. 47. 40 in the United States and 7 overseas, and they span from Sydney, Australia to Berlin, Germany. Now, um, there have been some critics of yours that have said, well, you know, that those numbers may or not be totally accurate. Um, in fact, there's only X amount of chapters and uh, membership is falling off. What do you, what do you, how do you respond well, to that? They've said that all the time. I mean, uh, I'm here 14 years. I've recently been shot. I could have easily taken the Red Beret, bronzed it, hung it up on a ring, and done any number of things. But because we have this outstanding nucleus, sure, one chapter may have a problem. You help that chapter. This is not the kind of an organization that has Big Daddy Warbucks in Washington that pours money on it as if it's an endless hole. No, but when we have chapters that are having problems, Problems. We come to their aid, we resuscitate it, we give them CPR. And if we weren't a legitimate organization, we wouldn't be invited into all these places now globally that never before could have ever thought of themselves as having guardian angels. You know, it, it struck, it was interesting to me to see an article in uh, Fortune magazine about, um, uh, you had said that there's a lot of the, the youth and the, and the interracial aspect of the guardian angels, but you see these corporate white collar guys yeah. nine to five uh, getting home from the office and throwing on the on the t-shirt and the cap and uh, and going out and, and walking the beat walk, working the streets um, was that a surprise to you to start to see some other involvement and did it bring credibility to your organization which I'm sure it had to have oh no doubt uh, we've had a number of young men young women from the corporate sector fortune 500 companies the uh, article you're referring to is a guy Mark Rizal from Bridgeport Connecticut who lives in the Gold Coast but comes back to the city of his birth Bridgeport to patrol that area and he leads a group that is predominantly made up of inner city youths mm -hmm. who didn't have the opportunities that he had but he now uses his training, his organizing ability, his wherewithal to keep that group organized and we're tapping into that and we're finding many more young men, young women from middle class and upper uh, and uh, affluent backgrounds who are deciding, hey, you know, this is almost like the Peace Corps VISTA. 
you know, I can give voluntarily eight hours a week and yet still lead my professional life so that I don't have to give up the payments of the mortgage and my career path and yet still feel like I'm, I'm making a difference along the way. Are the numbers, though, dwindling in, in regard to your peak? Where are you now in comparison to where you were in the 80s? Oh, we're in much better shape because we're more diversified. Uh, back then, uh, we may have had uh, 2,000, 3,000, but they were similarly all of the same type. They were from the inner city. It wasn't the diversity. Anytime you have someone killed in the line of duty, we've had four guardian angels killed. We've had three dozen seriously injured like myself. I have four, five bullet holes, but that's not the first time it's ever happened. There's 36 others who have been seriously injured. You're gonna lose a lot of people, not because they wanna leave, but their loved ones will force them to leave. And they'll have, you know, they'll have second thoughts. And you lose some, and then you begin recruiting and rebuilding. It's just a natural process of growth and development. Have you ever just said, enough, I, let's put it behind me, that was the 80s, that was a chapter in my life that worked. Mm -hmm. What drives you to continue? You've got a good radio show with your wife, Lisa, of course, um, uh, in the mornings on WABC Radio, doing pretty well with that. Have you ever just said, geez, let's just close the chapter, move on? You le nearly lost your life eight months ago. What, what can makes you keep going? Well, part of the problem, I think, today is the failure of responsibility taken by males. It's male role models who are failing society. Uh, and even though it's an age of equality and we're supposed to be the sensitive males of the 90s, we still must take our number one responsibility and that is raise the little ones. Mm -hmm. Now, I've developed this group. No one thought it would work. I have a lot of people depending on me. And even though it's been 14 years, if you're a student of history, increments of change come in 20-year periods. Mm -hmm. So unless we get through a 20-year period and become mainstream, what I would have done is I would have been given a gift, an opportunity to do something that so many others have not been given, and toss it aside because tough times. Did my grandfather do that or my father when they went through the Depression, when they lost businesses, when they were thrown out in the street on a cold water flat in Skillman Street in the Williamsburg section of Brooklyn? They didn't toss in the towel or I wouldn't be here today. Right. They never walked out on me. They never gave up on me. So I'm certainly not going to give up because I've had some tough times. There's a lot of people out there watching right now who've had a lot tougher time of life than I've, had a, I've ever had. I've been given the royal red carpet treatment. Five bullet holes, okay, I would say that's pretty tough. Marrying my wife, that's pretty tough. <laughs> but I've had a lot easier time than a lot of folks out there just trying to survive. Are the angels your number one priority? Absolutely. Uh, number one priority in everything. If I had to give up the radio program with this head, we don't like your involvement with the guardian angels. Tough luck, baby. I walk because the guardian angels is what I've developed. It's a part of me. It's my future. It's all I'm about. And other than family and responsibility to mom, dad, and naturally wife and extended family, that is the number one priority. Uh, okay. Um, April of last year, you are attacked by a group of three guys with bats, um, broken wrist. Any indication of what this was all about, and um, do you feel it is connected in any way to the June, as realistically, assassination attempt on your life? Oh, it is. And uh, I know exactly who, who conspired to do it, and now recognize the power that I had had with that early morning microphone on WABC. Uh, this was during the trial of John Gotti. And every day I'd be on the stump, the bully pulpit, attacking the public for making him not public enemy number one, but as if he was an Amnesty International prisoner of war. I couldn't believe it. So I started critiquing what the Gotti family was about and all that they've done wrong. And when he was finally found guilty and sent off to Marion, you saw the response in the streets, turning over cars, young Italian guys going crazy outside the federal courtroom. But it was retribution, because I kept hammering away at the point. And I've been around the block a few times. I understood that there's a cause and effect. They attacked me the first time, but I thought I was Superman. Hey, they couldn't even do me in with baseball bats. A broken wrist, stitches in the back of my head, and I walked out of it. And I didn't prepare myself, because three months later, obviously they had planned well, and they caught me at a vulnerable time. Do you feel your involvement was so much that they really wanted to end your life? If they could have, uh, they would have, and I certainly didn't do anything physically that I could say, gee whiz, I was real quick there. Had to be the guy above, because mm -hmm. I should have been in a pine box. Mm -hmm. 
But it taught me a lot of lessons. And when you press people's buttons, uh, they become irrational, and they're prone to do crazy things. And I'm also vulnerable, whereas prior to that, 14 years, only kryptonite could have taken me down. Now I recognize that you or anyone else walking the streets. So you hear footsteps now, whereas you didn't hear it before. Mm. Um, John Gotti, in terms of a police investigation, he, of course, now behind bars. His son is running around. Um, uh, do you think that the police investigation has been thorough? Uh, you do, of course, have many detractors within the police department. Oh, sure. Um, what else can be done, and are they doing what they should be doing to find these guys? Well, they pinpointed five guys, and their alibi was that they were playing cards at the Ravenite Social Club that morning at five, all five together. Uh, there's no gun now, because they obviously discarded it, and uh, just a full few bullet fragments in me. Well, until, I guess, they can put the gun into the hands of the gunman and make the connection to the bullet, they'll probably not seek prosecution. But in my heart, I obviously know, based on my street smart experience, of what that message was all about. Uh, Bruce Cutler, John Gotti's lawyer, I want to read you something, a quote from a New York Times article that, uh, from a recent New York Times article, um, Gotti's attorney, of course, Bruce Cutler. He's a fraud on you, his comments on you. He's a fraud, he's a phony, and he's a know-nothing. He doesn't know John Gotti, and he knows nothing about the criminal justice system. That red hat he wears makes him an expert in nothing. When E.F. When e. Hutton talks, people listen. When Curtis Sliwa talks, morons listen. Any, any response to that? He's right, because we've been suckers for a long time to elevate a guy like Bruce Cutler on some kind of pulpit as if he's Mr. The, the, the lawyer's lawyer. When in fact, look at who he's representing, mm -hmm. Murder Incorporated. And knowing that he represents Murder Incorporated makes him no better than Sammy the Bull Gravano or John Gotti himself. He's dirt, just like they are, and I hope they lock him up and throw away the key. He also seems very passionate about his feelings about you, and it, it's surprising to me that he would go to such lengths Getting to... Getting paid uh, big money. Yeah. Big money can make you passionate about a lot of things. Yeah. Um, any, in terms of your recovery, how are you at this point? I'm about 85% back. Uh, they had to rearrange all the plumbing inside, change the uh, copper fittings to brass fittings. But uh, I took my first White Castles last week. Did you? The Murder Burgers. And although there was a French Revolution in my stomach, <laughs> I somehow survived right. the Murder Burgers, the Belly Busters. So yes. I think I'm well on the road to recovery. You've got to love the White Castles, though. Well, believe it or not, it's better than my wife's cooking. Right. It's gourmet <laughs> cooking she, in Paris. She's going to love that one, Curtis. Oh, she agrees. <laughs> she says, look, if God had intended women to cook, he wouldn't have invented takeout food. Right. Um, then again, anytime I eat White Castle, uh, injuries are none. I, I think it's the same feeling for, <laughs> for me. Right. Sorry, White Castle. Um, getting a little more serious now. After that, you had uh, Rudy Giuliani, Dinkins. Um, uh, a lot of people come visit you in the hospital. And you're, the way you felt about it, you said you felt overwhelmed with guilt, and that's part of the reason as to why you came out and admitted to some of the earlier wrongdoings. Uh, made up the kidnapping of, um, uh, back in the early 80s, you had orchestrated some sort of a kidnapping that you admitted to being false. Tell me a little bit about why you came out, and does William Diaz play into that in terms of the uh, uh, New York Times article on how he said uh, you're, he's one of your big detractors. Talk to me a little bit oh, about sure. this. Well, I have many detractors out there, but the point is, you're shot, and you recognize you should have been dead, but for the grace of God, you're alive. And for the first time in your life, 38 years, everything stops. You have tubes jammed in your nose, jammed down your throat. You can't move. All you hear are the machines. You begin to reflect. And back then, rumors were surfacing in the, the papers that I was shot in a love triangle, that uh, yeah. I was cheating on my wife or she was cheating on me. This was some kind of message. I'm saying to myself, Lana, this is total garbage nonsense. But just imagine if some of the true details began to emerge. And I'm here unable to even speak. What could my wife possibly say? She knew nothing of this. She wasn't even around there. What could the worldwide lead, what could the German guardian angel or the Australian guardian angel or the Canadian guardian angel say when they, if they were asked these questions? Naturally, they would do what they think was the right thing and deny it. So it was important for me to clear the record because as the group grew and our acceptance grew, then I want people to know what actually went into this, mm -hmm. that it wasn't all the primrose path 
that uh, some chicanery had to be used because, and this is the very reason, this puts it in a nutshell, in the Bronx, I could get you, the reporter, up there if I shot somebody square in the head, or if I had a bucket of gasoline and said, hey, Channel 4, I'm going to light this up, this building, and burn it down. You'd be there with the mini cams. But if I told you that we were going to do a good deed, we were going to help the senior citizens, and we were going to protect people, not on your life would they be there in a pack of Sundays. Mm -hmm. The nature of the bad news is big news, good news, slow news. So I felt I had to manufacture some positive news. John Avildsen, a film director, who mm -hmm. was thinking about doing a picture on your life, uh, put it in these words, and I think it's... Uh, it's a it's a decent way of summing up what happened and we're wrapping things up here on Curtis Lee he didn't hurt anybody he didn't make money off what he did what he did wasn't the end of the world it was done solely to spread the word about the guardian angels and increase the number of volunteers his organization had no publicist and Curtis was forced to use his wits see your feelings on that well he uh, surmised it. he knew the true story mm -hmm. because when he purchased the rights to do a film I told him this back in 1986 it knocked him off his chair, but he said, you know, one day you're going to have to tell this, and you should just tell it like it is, and that's exactly what I did when I came off that bet. I mean, I should have been dead, so I had a second chance at it. So you clear the record straight, and then you just pursue onward. All right, unfortunately, we're out of time. Um, is there going to be a film in the future? Who knows about Hollywood? If I was a dope-smoking, oozy-toting knucklehead, they'd probably have Ice-T or Ice Cube playing me right now. But uh, Holly weird. They're not, they're not into the good guy syndrome unless right. uh, he has some kind of perversion or he's really a freakazoid. So right. we'll have to stay tuned and see. Okay, good luck with the, uh, the possible movie, future. Any politics involved as we have about one, one second? Everyone thinks I'm running, but uh, I'm only running from my wife. She'll probably run for office before yeah. I will. Curtis, thank you very much for being Appreciate here. Appreciate it.